Hi everybody and welcome to chapter 14, how biological diversity evolves. So we are going to be moving straight on from our um, evolution lecture into exactly how some of these things happened and, um, and the result of them, meaning like speciation or the creation of new species. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Now, I did include a couple of learning objectives for you guys. This is kind of just to kind of help you focus on some of these lectures and where you need to go and what you need to be focusing on for your upcoming exam. So just keep these things in mind, um, especially when it talks about the differences between allopatric and sympatric speciation, stuff like that. Those could be easily um, essay questions on your exam. So make sure to study those and at least to kind of hit these key points when we're going over the lecture. And if you need to go back, you can always go back because this is a video. And you can always just rewatch me if you want to. I know you're all dying to rewatch this video several times. All right, go ahead, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is something called taxonomy. Now, taxonomy, also sometimes referred to as phylogenetics, um, this is essentially a way that we group organisms. So we are all in the class mammalia, meaning humans and every other mammal. Whales, cats, dogs, all of them fall under the class mammalia. Well, how do we know that we're under the same class? How do we know that we're all mammals? Well, we actually started doing this a long time ago. We started to group organisms based on their relatedness or what we assume to be their relatedness. Um, so that's how we kind of got the, you know, kingdoms like, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of like the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, all that kind of stuff. Those are basically just all taxonomy. It's just, it's, well, it's actually really, um, phylogeny is really it's what it is. Um, but it's a form of, of um, classification, different organisms into different groups. So if we were sitting here in America and we're trying to talk about, let's keep it current, a species of bat, right? Maybe we have the same species of bat here in um, North America that they do in say China, right? But how would we know it's the same species if we're calling it two different things? Maybe they call it the common black bat and maybe we call it the, you know, North American bat. It's the same bat species, right? So to basically to make these things a little bit more clear and define really what we're talking about, we give it what's called a scientific name. This is part of taxonomy. So what we're doing is we're, we're identifying these organisms and then we're classifying them and naming them using a universal language. And that universal language is typically Latin. Okay, so you're like, wait, I have to learn Latin? No, of course you don't have to learn Latin. Um, but we are going to give you some certain prefixes and suffixes and root words and stuff like that, which will help you kind of break down these names and stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we're talking about taxonomy, again, we're talking about grouping organisms, usually by relatedness. Now, this was actually invented by a guy named Linnaeus. And so Linnaeus came up a long time ago in the 1700s and he said, all right, we need a universal way to identify these things, a universal name. Because at the time, we didn't have things like the internet. You can't just publish on something and send it out to the, to the world in an instant. You had to spend years writing this stuff down and then making copies of it, and then maybe only a couple people actually got the chance to read it. So if you're physically far away from someone, you're not going to be able to necessarily share your results. So what they did is basically Linnaeus came up with this way and said, okay, let's stop calling it by these common names like the common bat and the black bat and the North American bat. Let's just come up with some kind of name so that we can all call it the same thing. So even if it's commonly called something else, scientifically, we all call it the same thing. This is where we actually got the scientific name. If you guys have heard of the scientific name, like ours for humans is Homo sapiens, right? Homo is our genus and sapiens is our species. So Homo sapiens, the genus and the species together makes up your scientific name. And these again are always going to be basically Latin based words. Um, and so this is that two part naming system that they were talking about when you talk about the genus and the species. Because what we're going to talk about when we talk about other taxonomy is we have really big groups like domains. Like if you're in the domain bacteria or, or uh, protista or uh, prokarya, there it is, um, all bacteria in the entire planet falls under that domain. If you're in the domain eukarya, which we are in, that is all eukaryotic cells. That includes all plants, all animals, all funguses, all produce, all everything if you're not a bacteria. Okay, so then the, the domains are the really the big one. And then we're going to get down to the kingdom. So now inside of that domain, we have the kingdom or say the kingdom animalia. That's where we fall under because we're an animal. They also have the kingdom plantae. Now we all fall under the domain eukarya, right? But now we're getting a little bit more specific. We're talking about the kingdom animalia, just animals. We're not worrying about the kingdom plantae. We're just worrying about the um, kingdom animalia. 
and then we're going to get down to the phylum, say chordata. So we're getting from this really big, broad group, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. The very smallest group is your species, right? A species, the definition of a species is an organism that is inter, um, that can be interbred or, or can reproduce with another species, another organ of that species. So humans are all the same species. So any human on the planet can reproduce with another human on the same planet. If you find another human on a different planet, let me know. That'd be awesome. Um, but so say um, all species of dogs, all species of dogs on the planet are the same species. Right? You can have different dog breeds, but you're talking about the same species, which means you can mix and choose and mix and match all of those dogs. Remember, we talked about that last week in evolution. They're all the same species. Okay, so the species is the very smallest one. You're just that species. You're a single species of bat, single species of human, single species of iguana, or whatever you're talking about. You're just that species. So that's where it comes with our scientific name. Again, Homo is our genus. Sapiens is our species. Together, they make up the scientific name. Now, typically, when people are writing the species, yes, yeah, sapiens is our species, but you don't just say sapiens. You would say homo sapiens. So in this case, usually when we're referring to the species, we actually include the genus as well. You can include the genus without, um, so like homo erectus, um, homo neanderthalens, ensis. Um, those are all different, again, in the same genus, but in a slightly different species than us. So let's go into a little bit more of that. So let's talk about these uh, panthers right here, okay? So this is kind of counterintuitive. It's kind of going the opposite way. I don't know why your book likes to flip things, um, but I'm gonna explain it the opposite way because I feel like it's just better. All right, so we have the domain eukarya, right? All the eukaryotic cells, your plants, your animals, your funguses, your protists, everything that falls under the, the domain eukarya is going to include these guys right here. Now, there's only about four different kingdoms in the domain Eukarya, so we're going to be focusing on the kingdom Animalia. So again, the domain is the largest group, the most inclusive group. It includes all of the different kingdoms. So under the domain Eukarya, you've got the kingdom Plantae, the kingdom Animalia, the kingdom Fungi, the kingdom Protista. All of those kingdoms fall right under here in the domain Eukarya. Now we're going to get a little bit smaller. So now we're just talking about the kingdom Animalia. Okay, we don't, want, we don't care about the funguses and the plants. We're just going to be focusing on the animalia, right? The animals. Then we move down to the phylum chordata. You can kind of think of it, and this isn't exactly, exactly correct, but to simplify, I'm going to say it like this. You can think of the phylum chordata means you have a backbone, right? Technically, you're in the subphylum vertebrata, but still, all of the chordates would be things that have backbones, right? Like, you know, um, like your fishes and your sharks and your bunnies and your, you know, cheetahs, right? Those are all going to fall into the phylum chordata, not things like crabs and worms that don't have vertebrae, right? And again, it's not exactly right, but I'm just simplifying here. I'm simplifying. All right. The class mammalia falls under the, again, the phylum chordata. Now we're just talking about the mammals. We're not talking about the class aves, which are the birds, the class reptilia, which are your reptiles, the class um, amphibia, which are your frogs and stuff. Uh, we're just talking about the class mammalia. So again, we're going really big and we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as we drive in. Okay. Um, so the next thing we can see, we're under the quarter, the order carnivora. Okay. So now we're just talking about all the carnivore animals, not the herbivores, the carnivores. Getting even more specific, we're talking about the family felidae. Uh, felidae, which are the felines, right? Specifically, we're talking about all cats. This includes your house cat. So this whole taxonomy here would be the same going into the same family. They are a feline family. All your lions, all your tigers, um, all that kind of stuff is going to fall under this family of felidae. Finally, you're moving to the genus Panthera. These are just your panthers. Okay, your panthers, your um, um, leopards, stuff like that. Um, what else are they called? I can't think of the word. <laughs> I can't think of more animals right now. Um, so again, this is the genus Panthera, and specifically if we're talking about this leopard right here, maybe not the snow leopards, right, not the jaguars, which are all going to be in the same Panthera family, okay, the Panthera genus, but they're going to be under the species Panthera partis, okay, so that's specifically just this one right here, not your snow leopards, just your regular leopards, this guy right here, okay, so again, his, when it comes to his species, like I said, we usually include the genus as well as the species together. That's kind of a scientific name. So that's what we call the species because it's being very, very specific. So now if I were to do a study here in North America versus a study here in China, still on the panthers, 
we can now talk about the fact that they are the same species because, or we talk about the same individual, um, because they are, we know for a fact that they are the same species, right? We're talking about the same organism, not a different type of panther that we call something else and they call, you know, purple panther. I don't know. I'm making stuff up here. Um, but again, this is a way to clarify between scientists when they're sharing their data that you are talking about the same species. You're not talking about two different panthers. You're talking about specifically the same panther. And I don't mean the same individual panther, like that's Tom the panther. No, we're talking about the same group of panthers. So when you do a study and you publish on it, you know that the, your study was uh, relative to all of the species of this species of panthers. All right. so. Let's talk a little bit about more about taxonomy and stuff like that. Um, this is what's known as a phylogenetic tree. So remember that I said taxonomy and phylogeny are kind of the same thing. They're not exactly the same thing, but in this class, we're going to simplify and say that they're kind of interchangeable. So what we have here is what's known as a phylogenetic tree. So it shows you different phylogenies or different groups, how they break up over time. Now, of course, we don't say this happened 1.2 million years ago and this happened. No. We don't know the exact evolutionary time, but it doesn't really matter. We know that at some point they were all related to each other, right? At some point they all had some common ancestor, just like we talked about with evolution when it comes to homologies, right? We all came from some original organism on the planet. We don't know what that is. It doesn't matter what that is. We know that through evolution, we have basically separated ourselves out into these different groups, but we all came from some early organism, probably some prokaryote, some ancient little bacteria that lived a really long time ago in the ocean. Now, we know that we have things like these different groups, so the first thing to split off are our domains. Remember, our domains are the most different from each other. So you can see the domain bacteria is the first one to separate off because it still has characteristics of this early organism. It's still just a bacteria. It's very small. It's very simple. It has very simple reproductive methods. Um, and therefore very different than say us. We are very multicellular. We're big, we're complex. These guys are unicellular. They're very, very tiny. Um, they're very, very simple. So uh, the eukaryotes are down here. And again, they include pretty much anything you can think of on the planet that's not a bacteria. So your protists, which again, are just going to be like your amoebas and different kind of groups that we don't really know how to classify. We just throw them all under protista. Then we have the kingdom plantae, which are all your plants, kingdom fungi, all your funguses, and then the kingdom animalia, which are all your animals. Now, right in between the domain bacteria and the domain eukarya are the domain archaea. And an archaea has characteristics that a eukarya has, but it also has characteristics that a prokaryote has. So we kind of put them in between in the middle because they're kind of like a transitional organism. They're not quite here. They're not quite here. So they're kind of their own group. And we're not going to be focusing too much on the archaeans, um, at least not today. Uh, we will in the future when we get to microbes and stuff. But today we're going to be focusing on mostly the eukaryotes. Now, the whole reason we built these phylogenetic trees is to kind of break down these different groups and see how they are related. So we know that all cats look the same. They're all cats, right? But we didn't know that back in the day. So we actually started to have things to group them. We're like, okay, well, these are all cat-like organisms. These are all dog-like organisms. So we started to break them up. But then we got really confused with a lot of stuff. And we're like, okay, where does a platypus go? It is like kind of like this duck bill face, but this big flat beaver tail and it's sort of a mammal but it lays eggs like that's where we get all, all crazy stuff going on so when you construct these phylogenetic trees it's kind of up to you how you choose to do them so usually what you want to do is you want to do the least amount of um of of nodes and we're going to get to what that is uh, means in just a second but the least amount of differences so you want to try to group them as similar as you can and then only if you have kind of like a weirdo off group that you try to figure out how to do with that later so we're going to talk about that um, so essentially what you're doing is you're building hypotheses on evolution. How did this organism come into play? Uh, where did this organism actually come from? So that's what we can kind of do. Like we can see things like, um, it's a good example. Can't even think of a good example right now. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll have some sample organisms coming up. Um, but if you are trying to figure out where that duck bill platypus belongs, you're like, is it a bird? Is it a mammal? I don't know. So again, you would have your argument that would be your hypothesis as to why you think that that particular phy phylogenetic tree would be more correct than others. Um, so what we're trying to do is we're basically trying to break them down into groups. And so these phylogenetic trees are kind of almost like us guessing how we think it actually happened. 
Can we test it? No. Can we nowadays with technology look back at genetics and determine if we are correct? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, so now we're actually realizing that some of these phylogenetic trees that we were making and, and believing for years are actually totally wrong. You know, we used to think that, I don't know, I can't even think of them. It's like hippos were more related to whales and it turns out they're more related to like cows. And you're like, wait a minute, how is that possible? They live in the water and they kind of swim. But, um, you know, all these things, again, can be tested nowadays with technology because we have things like, you know, DNA sequencing and we can actually look through and be like, okay, no, we thought they were totally related, but they're really not. They're actually very differently related or, or distantly related. Um, so again, this is kind of like our hypothesis as to what we believe happened. Again, we have these protists, which kind of they're, they're the sum of this like big category of protists. We don't actually know where to put them. So could this change if we actually discover new things? Yes, 100%. In fact, phylogenetic trees and phylogenies have been changing for years. When I was in school, the phylogenies were a lot different. Well, I wouldn't say a lot different. Some of them were a lot different than they are now. So what you're learning is actually updated information than what I learned. Um, and again, <laughs> phylogenies are crazy because they're constantly changing the more we get new discoveries, new technologies, and new stuff like that. Now, um, the phylogenetic trees actually started because of this guy, Heckel, right here. And he was the first one to try to make this into like this big broad idea and he was like okay so i know that these are kind of related i know that these are kind of related you know they're, they're plants and we're animals so they, we, we should be able to group them somehow so he's actually the first one to come up with this phylogenetic tree or the tree of life if you guys have ever heard the tree of life it's called the tree of life because essentially what you do is starting with some common ancestor that you have uh and again they can be oriented slightly different Right? So this is the earliest organism, and then you can think of this as like evolution or time moving forward, and now we're here. Um, same kind of thing with the evolutionary tree. You start off with here, you can see phylogenetic tree, evolutionary tree, tree of life, they're all basically the same. So this is our common ancestor, and then you can see quickly they branch off, and he obviously, he didn't get it perfect, but he was, he was pretty close. Um, first branch is plant A, branch is different from animals, okay? So if this was the domain... Eukary, he's actually got, he's pretty good right here. And then you've got the kingdom Protistae. So those are already the three um, kingdoms that we have. Now, one thing that people got wrong for a long time is that the fact that funguses are not plants. They are um, heterotrophs, meaning they consume nutrients. Plants make their own nutrients. They're autotrophs. Auto meaning self, troph meaning feeding. Uh, heterotrophs are different feeders. They actually have to go out and consume their nutrients. And that's what funguses do. So that mushroom actually ate something. And we're going to see videos on all sorts of, of how really crazy funguses get. It's actually pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, Heckel was the first guy who actually kind of came up with this whole tree form and said, like, okay, let's try to group these things with a tree. And this is something that we still use today. So even though he lived a long time ago, right, this is something that we still use today and still are trying to perfect to this day. Now, here's a couple different things, and I am going to have some kind of assignment for you guys to do on this. Um, I don't have it up yet. Actually, check your Canvas site. It might be up yet. I don't know. Um, so essentially what you're doing is wherever the base of the tree is, that's always going to be your ancestor, right? Your common ancestor that we all branched off from, that we all evolved from. Now, as soon as it branches and it splits right here, this is called a node. And a node means that there's some kind of uh, diversion that happens, right? Divergence, I should say, not divergence. Um, meaning this organism is now different than this organism. They went in two different paths. So we don't exactly know what happened or when it happened or how it happened, but we do know that now there are differences, right? Now there are for sure differences between these two organisms right here and right here. So what you want to do is when you're building these phylogenetic, uh, phylogenetic trees or evolutionary trees, you want the least amount of nodes possible. So what you can have is like, if you had a bird wing and a bat wing and a, you know, something else wing, right? You, this is like three nodes, but really what you'd want is you'd probably want, uh, it's kind of hard to describe. I don't have a board to draw on. Um, anyway, we're not going to be focusing too much on drawing these. I do want you kind of to group them a little bit, but we're going to have a whole assignment for that. So don't worry if I'm not explaining it well. It's really hard to do without being able to draw and use um, examples on the board. And I can't draw on my monitor. I don't want to mess it up. Anyway, so let's just let's just focus back on reading these real quick. So again, this is called a node. This is basically how they split. So what you look at is you look at the distances 
between the two organisms. So if I had organism A and organism B right here, you can see one that they're very close together, but two, they branch not way down here, but actually pretty high up right here. So that means that these guys are actually stayed pretty closely related for a long period of time, right? And it wasn't until they reached this point that they actually diverged from each other. So if you were to look at A and B versus A and C, you could see, hopefully you could see, that A and B are going to be very closely related. Much more closely related than A and C or B and C. Even though they're right next to each other, these guys branched off from C, D, and E a long time ago. Okay, so since they branched off from C, D, and E a long time ago, A and B are going to be closely related. C, D, and E are going to be pretty closely related, but A and B and C, D, and E are going to be very distantly related, right? This group is going to be very different than this group. They did all have a common ancestor, but it branched so far ago, or so long ago, they're going to be fairly different still. Now, um, when we look at C, D, and E branching from each other, you can see that C and D stayed together for longer. It wasn't, it was actually, it was E that branched off kind of first by himself, this E is called an outgroup or an outlying group. And so this E, even though C, D, and E are pretty closely related to each other, E is separate from C and D. Okay, so he branched off on his own. So that means he is more distantly related than C and D. C and D would be pretty closely related, right? And E would be something like way over here. Um, if I wanted to do an example of this, we could say dinosaurs, straight up dinosaurs, right? Dinosaurs evolved into some with wings and some without wings, okay? So the E would be, sorry, wings and feathers and stuff like that. Dinosaurs did have this back, stuff back in the day. Um, there was a smaller group of dinosaurs that were actually feathered. Uh, and we believe, again, so you have your big dinosaurs over here, but then from those dinosaurs, from those ancient dinosaurs, some of the groups went off and kind of evolved on their own. And now you have C would say be birds and D would be things like reptiles. So birds and reptiles were once a dinosaur, but the dinosaurs are now way over here, and birds and reptiles are fairly still closely related. Okay, but they all came from some ancestral dinosaur way back in the day, and that is actually true, and that is actually a fact, that um, birds and reptiles are just modern day dinosaurs. She's really small. All right, so hopefully this kind of helps. Um, you guys have your keys right here. Remember, this is your ancestor. These are all your descendants, and then you're moving up in time. You're moving forward in time or left to right in time, depending on however you're orienting your tree. It's really kind of up to you when it comes to drawing this stuff. Okay. So, um, again, this node right here is some theoretical common ancestor that we believe was actually existed. We don't know what it was. It's kind of like that missing link that people talk about when we talk about evolution. So just because we haven't found this little guy right here doesn't mean that he did, did not exist. Not mean that, doesn't mean that we didn't come from him, right? We just don't know what it is yet, yet, okay? So um, these guys right here, so this would be taxon A and taxon B. These are just groups. This is just groups, so don't let the word taxon fool you. just means group. Okay, so taxon A and taxon B, because they share a direct common ancestor, would be called sister taxa or sister groups meaning that A and B are very closely related to each other, okay? Taxon C is known as the out group. Remember, it's kind of outside on its own. It's kind of that group that kind of just is super separate. So even though they all had a common ancestor here, this guy branched off a long time ago and is now totally different, where these guys stayed pretty closely related until right at the end, and they still have a common ancestor, and that's, for, that's why they would be considered sister taxa or sister groups. Again, don't let that word taxa or taxon just fool you. It just means group. Just means group. Okay. So here's getting a little bit more complicated. We've just knocked our tree over. So this is our ancestral lineage here. You can see that this taxon G, this is our out group, right? The first one that doesn't share any other common ancestor. These are all kind of sort of related. This guy, boom, off on his own. The fact that he's off on his own, we kind of call him a basal uh, taxon or a base group. So think of like our bacteria that we talked about. Remember, he was the first one that diverged like way back in the day. He's not really closely related to really anybody. That kind of would be our basal ta uh, taxon right there. That would be our bacteria. Now, when we have our branch point right here, this is where those, those lineages diverge, meaning those groups are now going to be different, okay? The birds are now different than the reptiles. They have diverged, okay? So that would be a branch right here. 
Um, if you follow this down again, this would be our outgroup for this particular taxa. But these would be sister taxa because they are on the same branch. Now, sometimes you can have multiple sister taxas. Right, so notice all three, boom, boom, boom. These are all on the same branch. There's only one branching part. That's known as polytomy. Um, it's basically, they're kind of all branching from a certain point, but we don't exactly know how or when that happened. Um, so we haven't really resolved that issue yet. So we just know that they did become different, but they just kind of all branched at the same time, and we don't know who came first or which came where. So we just kind of leave it that they all branched at some point. These two we know. There was a common ancestor here. This is still the common answer, common answer, com common ancestor. And then boom, at some point they diverged at this point. So they're still very closely related. So these two would be more closely related than these. Also, notice the location on how far back you are. So again, this is we're time. This is time moving forward. Okay, so if you split way back here, you're more different than if you were to split right up here. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, remember we have our um uh, you can always ask me questions and stuff like that. Please shoot, shoot me an email, online tutoring video and stuff like this. Hopefully my video later will, will kind of help you on this. All right, so let's go back to those birds and reptiles and dinosaurs that we talked about. Now remember, I was just giving you an example. This is just off the top of my head. This is actually more accurate to what is actually happening. So what we had here is some ancestral organism, right? And then things like the common ancestor of crocodiles and dinosaurs and all birds would basically be right here. Okay, so we know that they kind of were all sort of reptile-ish. Um, and that's why the snakes and the lizards kind of come off first. They're just, just kind of the first out group that goes, you know, you're on your own. But then we have things like the crocodiles, the pterosaurs, um, and then some of these other dinosaur groups that we now can count, classify based on um, DNA information and stuff like that. So the first, again, after this common ancestor of all these guys, crocodiles were the first one. Then you had your flying dinosaurs right here. Then you had your, um, oh, what's this one? I forget what his is. It's like an allosaur. I'm not great with dinosaurs. And then you have things like your raptors and your T-Rexes. And remember, again, raptor means bird of prey. They said that in the first Jurassic Park movie. Um, and that's because they all kind of, they are kind of like, this is why birds are still called raptors sometimes because they basically did have this common ancestor. There was a smaller group of dinosaurs that did have feathers that eventually kind of diverged off and became the birds that we know of today. But they did have that raptor relative. So that's why, rap, uh, you know, velociraptors and, you know, bird, things like um, uh, buzzards and stuff are still called raptors because they did have this common ancestor. So yes, birds are modern day dinosaurs. I know, it's like, can you imagine? The T-Rex with the little wings? No, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so where did mammals come from? Remember that duck little platypus? We're like so confused by him. He's kind of a duck, he's kind of a platypus, he kind of lays eggs, it's weird. So what we did is we started to group these things by common characteristics, and that's really where we're going. So when you look at stuff like this, you're like, well, how did you, how did you come up with this? Like, how did you know that these two are the same, but these guys are totally different? Well, what you do is you list characteristics. And this is these little notches. And this is what you, what I was trying to say earlier, this is what you want to have like the fewest of. You want to have the fewest of these like differences in their characteristics. So to start off, we have an iguana, right? Versus mammals. So of course my iguana is going to be in our outgroup. He's not a mammal, right? He's a reptile, whereas all of these other ones are mammals. Now we know this now, but we didn't exactly know this. So if I were to compare these, I'd look at all of them and okay, well, these three have hair, and this guy doesn't. Okay, that puts him in an out group, and that puts them together in an in group, right? They are all having this characteristic of having hair. The other thing is they all have mammary glands, okay? This is essentially how moms feed their babies, right? The mammary glands. So this guy does not have those. So there's two characteristics now that all these guys have that this guy doesn't have, which means all these guys must be more closely related than this guy. So he must be the out group. Okay, then we look at things like gestation, meaning like when you're um, growing your baby, essentially. So we look at internal gestation versus external gestation. So again, remember the duffel pad was lays eggs and you're like, what? He's a mammal. All mammals like, give live birth. Yes and no. We have our out group, the duckbill platypus, when it comes to this characteristic, the gestation. Then we look at internal gestation and we say, okay, well, 
There are straight-up beavers who have a long internal gestation. That's like humans, right? That nine, ten months that we have before we pop out a kid. And then we have things like kangaroo who who basically lay their, have their, lay their babies, have their babies, but then they keep them in that marsupial pouch so that they can actually keep developing. So it's a shorter gestation period, but they almost have this like external gestation. So they're not doing everything internally. So it's shorter gestation, but then they can behaviorally like kind of almost gestate them in their little marsupial pouch. Now that's not exactly how that works, but again, I'm just giving you a simplified version of it. All right, so again, this is just another example of some of these taxonomies, right? We have the order Carnivora, right? We have the family. We have Felidae if we're talking about our cats. Mistulidae if you're talking about um, things like otters and skunks. And Canidae if you're talking about things like canines. So this is how you can kind of break them down. Yes, they're all carnivores, but they're very different carnivores from each other. Then you move on to the genus. So the genus Panthera, well, again, gives you all of your leopards. Um, Mephitis is going to give you your skunks. Lutra is going to give you your, your otters. Canis is going to give you your dogs, right? And then you just break them down even further. So in this case, we have things like Canis latrans, which would be your coyote. Things like Canis lupus would be your wolf. Okay, so this is how we break it down very specifically and finally getting to the actual species of it. So again, just more examples how you can read these trees. Now, how to construct these, and yes, I am going to give you guys a table um, as soon as I make it. I'm going to give you guys a table to do for homework, but you are going to make me a phylogenetic tree. It's actually pretty simple to do. What you want to do is you want to make one of these little character tables. And so when you have your organisms, and I'm going to give you just a bunch of random different organisms, you want to look at some of the characteristics. So if these are my organisms right here, I could say, oh, hey, um, this guy has fur. Nobody else has fur. Okay. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> so, or fur, hair, same thing. So in this case, the first characteristic that I would put down would be hair. The lancelet doesn't have it, the lamprey doesn't have it, the tuna doesn't have it, the salamander doesn't have it, the turtle doesn't have it, leopard does have it, okay? So I'd write zero for all of these guys, and I'd write a one or a check for the fact that the leopard has it. I'd look at them again. Okay, well, some of these are going to have, well, four legs, four legs, four legs, no legs. Okay, so the presence or absence of legs, right? Of four legs. Okay, so we can write four legs. Some of them have it, some of them don't have it. How many of them have jaws? For those of you who've never taken my marine biology class, lancelets, right? Lancelets and uh, lampreys do not have jaws. So lampreys kind of have this little sucking mouth. Um, lampreys are just basically going to suck onto you. They're like parasites, so they're just going to suck onto you and like suck out your fluids and stuff if you're fish, obviously. Um, but they do not have an actual working jaw. So that hinge in your jaw is something that came around after lampreys. So lancelets are kind of like the first of the chordates. They, they're like on their way to having a backbone. And then you finally have things like your lampreys, which are at the beginning of your chordates, but they don't have jaws. Okay, so presence or absence of jaws. And then now you can kind of see, okay, well, this guy, remember the vertebrae? Um, so remember we're in the phylum chordata, the subphylum vertebrata. So the lancelet is in the phylum chordata, but they are not in the subphylum vertebrata, which means they don't have a true backbone. All these other guys do. So again, you're just basically looking at these characteristics. Now I'm going to give you characteristics that are a lot more simple than these characteristics. If you didn't know that a lamprey doesn't have a jaw, then you wouldn't be able to do that. If you didn't know that um, this lancelet isn't in the phylum chordata, again, it would be kind of hard to, to do this kind of stuff. So I'm going to simplify this for you guys. But this is essentially what you do. So now based on your characteristics and based on how you can separate them, we start off with the phylum chordata, great. Who has a vertebrae? Oh, not that guy, but the rest of them do. So then you would write right here, vertebral column. Vertebral column. Okay, so this basically means, the way that this way is going is this is our ancestor and this is time as we go up. Every time you reach a new characteristic, right, this vert, uh, vertebral column, or the vertebrae, which means every single one of these, their, their nodes or their branches are after the column. Okay, so what that means, every single one of these guys is going to have a vertebrae. So the next one right here, we move to, oh, this one has jaws, so which means all of these other guys here are going to have jaws, but the lamprey doesn't. So the lamprey would branch off because he does not have a jaw yet. Then we move up from jaws. Oh, four walking legs. Tuna doesn't have four walking legs. Tuna now branches off. 
Now, all of these other salamander turtle leopard are all going to have four walking legs. As we move up, the salamander does not have an amniotic egg, right? We do. Then you keep going. The turtle has an amniotic egg, but it doesn't have hair. So then you can branch it. Technically, this last one at the end, you could switch. And all you'd have to do is write hair on this little node right here. So you could essentially write it right here. So if I were to say, mm, what can I do for this one? Um, turtles, right? It has a shell. Nobody else right here has a shell, right? So if I wanted to draw right here, this little line here, not on here, because that means, right? If I were to draw where the amniotic egg was, that means the leopard and the turtle have a shell. That's not true. Okay, but I could draw it right here. And that would mean that the leopard has hair, but the turtle has a shell. Okay, so that's kind of how you can break off those two branches at the very, very end too, um, depending on what characteristics you choose. And again, I'm going to simplify this for you guys. It's not going to be as complicated as this is. So, but this is how you do it. Now, when you're building a phylogenetic tree, there's not necessarily a wrong. So remember what I told you, you want the least amount of nods and least amount of little characteristics that separate each one. Um, but it's not necessarily wrong however you draw it. So let's go for this one. W, X, Y, Z. Okay? If we look at this, W is our out group, X, Y, Z is our in group, X is the out group for Y and Z, Y and Z are closely related. Well, what if I were to take this guy right here and switch him around? Now, instead of W, X, Y, Z, I have W, Z, Y, X. But what's the difference? X is on an out group on its own, okay? Z and Y are closely related. What if I switch just Z and Y around? Doesn't matter. So again, it does not matter exactly how you put it. So every single one of these right here, and I want you guys to really look at these on your own, they're all identical, okay? Doesn't matter if this one's over here, over here, over here, over here. It doesn't really matter as long as it makes sense based on the characteristics that you chose. Then it will still, evolutionarily wise, still make sense. And this is, again, how we get things like all of these different flowers, all these different organisms. We basically just have all this divergence that's been coming out little by little. And then we work to classify these things. We work to separate these things and say, okay, that's a daisy and that's a lily and that's a geranium and that's a base. And then this is how they're all related to each other. So we can do this with animals. We can do this with plants. We can do this with funguses. We can do this with a lot of things. Now, the only thing we can't do this with is things that aren't a species. So remember, I kept telling you we need to break these things down into species. Well, if you don't have a species, then this actually won't work. And this is known as the biological species concept. So things like bacteria, they don't have species, right? Because species means, the definition of a species is interbreeding organisms. Bacteria don't breed, right? There's no sexual reproduction there. You have one bacteria, he grows and splits into two, now you have two bacteria. So they're not considered a species because the definition of a species is an interbreeding organism, meaning it can breed with another of that species. Um, that's why you can't have things like horses and cows breed. They are two totally different species, and therefore you can't breed a horse and a cow. You can mix two different dog species together or dog breeds together because they're the same species. They're not different species. They're the same species. So let's talk about species because this is what we're going to be focusing on. Excuse me. This is what we're going to be focusing on next is species. So despite the fact that there is diversity in all species, every single species, there is diversity. So if we look at these humans here, we are all the same species. I don't care what country you're from. I don't care what color skin you have. I don't care if you grew up under a rock. You are the same species as every single human being on the, other, on the, same, on the planet. That's it. You are the same species. Now, we look very, very different. That is variation. Okay, that is variation in the population. Remember, that's something that we talked about when it comes to evolution, too. You want variation in the population. This whole coronavirus stuff that's going on right now, um, there is variation in the population. Some people are susceptible. Some people are not. If everybody was susceptible, this would be a global extinction and we'd all be dead. Right? But there's variation in the population, so not everyone is getting it hit as hard as some people are. That's a good thing. That's why you want variation in the population. Um, so again, those species of cheetah, what happens if they had a virus that comes in and it wipes out all of them because there's no variation, right? That's why you want variation. Always, always, always want variation in a population. Now, uh, you have variation within the same species, right? That's humans. 
However, you can also have similarities between two species. So in this case, we have two different bird species right here, two different bird species right here. And you're like, wait, those are the same birds. They're not. So just because they look alike doesn't actually make them the same species. Maybe they look alike, but they act very different, which means if this guy does a mating call and this guy doesn't recognize his mating call because they're not the same species, they will never reproduce. So if you can't be the same species, if you're not reproducing, remember species, interbreeding organisms, right? You can breed with the same species. These guys can't breed just because of things like behavior. You think, well, okay, that's not enough reason to actually make them different species, but it actually is. And that's what we're going to be talking about the rest of the, um, the lecture today. Who's this guy, right? This is a Zorse. This is a Zorse. This is a zebra horse. Okay, so we basically took a zebra horse, or zebra, and bred it with a horse. Now, are zebra and horses the same species? And they look alike. No, they're actually not. So this is kind of the problem with um, what's called hybrid species. Now, we are humans, and we like to mess with things, and sometimes we like to mess with their genes. And so what we do is we kind of make these, like, hybrids. And so in the wild, a zebra and a horse would never be even in the same continent. Like zebras are from, you know, the plains of Africa and horses are from Europe. So realistically, we would never have a zebra and a horse breeding because you can't breed if you live on a different country, you know, in a different country. So some problems that arise with the biological species concept is that we get involved and we start messing with things like creating hybrids. So normally this would never happen in nature, but we can actually make this happen in real life. Like those birds that we talked about. So in nature, they would be too different and, and behaviorally they would never mate. But can we take their, you know, can we take sperm from one and egg from another and make a, yeah, we could. But again, that's not what's happening in nature. So there's a couple problems with the biological species concept. Um, like, you know, the fact that we mess with it all the time. Um, so normally what happens when you produce a hybrid, like think of a lion and a tiger, right? Anyone seen Napoleon Dynamite? Ligers. Yeah, so a lion and a tiger are two different species. When you mate them, when you artificially mate them, you can produce a liger. Now that is called a hybrid. That liger, however, because they're not the same species, is what's called sterile, meaning they cannot have offspring of their own or they're infertile. And that's what happens a lot of the times. If these two non-species were actually to mate together, you have uh, what's called, you know, decreased hybrid st uh, viability and stuff like that, which we're going to talk about about later on in the um, in the lecture. But sometimes their DNA actually does match. So like this Zorse right here, he actually is kind of okay. So sometimes we can actually produce fertile hybrids. Um, and then therefore you're like, okay, well, is it a hybrid or are they the same species? Because if their offspring is fertile, they should be the same species. But this is kind of where it gets into like that problematic, is it really a species, is it not? you know, this again would never happen in nature. So is it a true, are they truly the same species or do we, did we just mess with it enough that we allowed them to, to reproduce and make a, an, a fertile offspring? So arguments still out, definitely arguments still out when it comes to that one. Um, we already talked about asexual organisms like bacteria. So asexual organisms can't be classified under the biological species concepts because they're not reproducing with anybody else. They're asexual. One pops into two. So you really, it's hard to classify when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, extinct organisms also, you can't say that the T-Rex and the Velociraptor were different species because were they interbreeding? We have no idea. Nobody was there for that. So it's not perfect, this biological species concept, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's there for evidence. It's there for support. It's there for kind of helping us determine which group belong with which. And again, this is phylogeny, this is taxonomy, this stuff changes all the time. Such a pain in the butt. Um, so just keep that in mind, just keep that in mind. Okay. All right, let's talk about the morphological species concept. We're talking about the biological species concept. Can you reproduce with someone? Yes, then you are the same species. Morphological species concept. This is when, this is what we've been doing for hundreds of years because before we actually got things like genetics and labs and we could actually do, you know, hybrid growing and stuff like that, we were looking at morphology and morphology just means physical structures. 
What do you look like? What does your morph look like? So the fact that all of these insects have wings probably means that they're kind of closely related, right? They all look like bugs and they all have wings. That is their morphology. Now we learned about homologous traits and analogous traits. Homologous is coming from the same ancestor, meaning all mammals have the same bones in their hand because we're all from the same mammal. But things like bird wings and bat wings are very different. That's analogous because they did not come from the same common ancestor. Um, but they live in the same habitats and they feed the same way and that's why they actually develop those, those wing structures independently because they use them in the same way. So looking at the morphological species uh, or just looking at morphology isn't always the best and this is why but this is what we've been doing because it's it's obviously the easiest. You all have wings. Boom, I'm going to put you in that group. You all have fur. I'm going to put you in that group. Um, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but we are learning a little bit more about this when we now that genetics and things like that have come into play. So it's, again, not perfect, but still, it's just one of these concepts. We're just we're trying to figure out any way we can to separate these groups into their correct groups, and these are all just hypotheses. We're just figuring it out as we go. And, and hoping that we get it correct. Okay, let's talk about some barriers. So we're gonna be talking about some reproductive barriers. Um, and I'm gonna go through them briefly and then I'm gonna go through them in more in greater detail. So say you have two organisms and you don't know if they're the same species and you're trying to see if they can breed. There's a bunch of different barriers that they have to actually overcome to have a viable baby. Remember, if they have a viable baby, meaning it lives and it is fertile, meaning it can have its own babies, then it, they are presumed that it is the same species. So the first thing you have to get over is what's called temporal isolation. Now there are prezygotic barriers and postzygotic barriers. We're gonna talk about the prezygotic barriers first. Remember, a zygote is a developing baby, right? The egg has been fertilized by the sperm and now it's a zygote. Okay? So prezygotic means before mating happened before that sperm and that egg got together. So these are all prezygotic, meaning you don't have a zygote yet. So temporal isolation means timing. Okay, so temporally, you mate at different times. Maybe you mate in the morning and this guy mates at night. You're not even gonna be out at the same time. So you're never even gonna run into the other one because he's out during the day and you're out at night. How can you mate if he's asleep and you know, you're out working or whatever you do, you're an animal. Um, okay, so the timing is off. Or um, when it comes to, say, if you're a plant, right, maybe you bloom in the spring and another plant blooms in the fall. Timing's off, right? You're never going to be able to fertilize each other because you're blooming at different times, which means the, sh the timing is just way off and you're never, it's never going to happen. Habitat isolation, you are physically isolated from each other. Those are two spe uh, species of snakes that are separated by a mountain range. Are snakes gonna be able to crawl over that cold, cold mountain? Nope, yep. which means you're never physically gonna be in the same place. Maybe you could mate. Maybe you could have viable babies, but you're not gonna be able to because you're not even in the physically in the same place. Behavioral isolation, this is kind of what we talked about with the birds. So maybe some bird sings some beautiful song and some beautiful melody and the other bird's like, that's not what I want. I want you to flap your wings and bounce your head around like an idiot, right? Remember like the bird video we saw? Okay, so now he's like, I can't mate with you. I don't even know what that means. And, you know, right? So now behaviorally, right, your mating rituals don't line up. So that even though you are there at the same time and in the same place, you could, you're not going to because you're like, I don't even recognize what that is. If that's a mating dance, not my forte. And again, female choice. She's not going to choose some weird male because she's going to be like, I don't know, maybe he's sick in the head or something. I don't know what's wrong with him. Um, She's going to choose a male of the species that she knows, so the song that she knows, and therefore the behaviors that she knows. Mechanical isolation. This is a fun one. Um, imagine a chihuahua and a Great Dane. Mechanically, that's just not going to work. Yeah, you could reproduce. You're in the same place at the same time. Technically, you're the same species. Yeah, you're just, ooh, that's just, that's, that's just mechanics. It's just, that's just not going to work. Okay, so sometimes your genitalia physically just don't line up. That's mechanical isolation. And finally, we have gametic isolation. So your gametes are your sperm and your eggs. So they're really, they're both um, kind of triggered by these hormones and these chemical cues in your body. And therefore, if you have different chemical cues than another species, 
maybe the sperm's not even going to recognize the egg. Maybe the egg's not going to let the sperm in, right? You just, the chemicals don't work and therefore you can't actually have fertilization. Maybe you had copulation, right? Physically, you were able to do the deed, but now your sperm's like, I don't know. They just, chemically, they just don't match up. So I think I just breezed through most of these right here. Ah, and then our post-zygotic barriers um, are going to be post-zygotic. So there was a zygote that was actually formed. So you made it at the same time, in the same place, behaviorally doing the same thing to actually get each other to mate. Physically, your genitalia lined up, your mechanics worked, and the sperm and the egg were able to talk to each other and communicate and actually have fertilization. Okay, if all of those things are okay and happen, then you get to the post-zygotic barriers. Meaning, all right, now can you get over this hump? So we see that we have um, three different ones. One is reduced hybrid viability, meaning it just, they don't, they don't last very long. Okay, so you had a hybrid, but he doesn't live as long as he's supposed to. Maybe they're supposed to live 10 years. Maybe he lives like a year or six months, something like that. So he lives, he was able to grow, but he doesn't do well. Uh, the next one is reduced hybrid fertility, meaning you have a donkey and a mule. Sorry, you have a donkey and a horse and you make a mule. It's the other way around. Horse and a mule make a donkey? No, horse and a donkey make a mule. There it is. Horse and a donkey make a mule. Um, so you, you have your mule, which is great, right? It's got the strength of the horse. It's got the, you know, loyalty of whatever the donkey. But that mule is sterile. So you can't have more little mule babies until you reproduce these again. Right, the mule cannot have kids of his own, therefore he is sterile or infertile. Right, that's because these two are not the same species. And therefore when they try to make, you know, a baby, chemically it just, it doesn't quite work out. We really have to be in perfect balance to be able to survive and to be able to have offspring. And if, if we're not, if we're out of balance in any way, meaning sometimes it's just our DNA that's out of balance, we're not gonna be, have those, we're gonna be able to have those offspring. Um, hybrid breakdown. So hybrid breakdown is, I shouldn't be smiling, hybrid breakdown, uh, you die, yeah, you just don't do as well. Hybrid uh, viability and breakdown are kind of the same thing. So maybe you were actually able to form a zygote in here, but it instantly starts to kind of, yeah. So your hybrid is not gonna be able to survive, it's not gonna be sterile if it does survive, and it's certainly not gonna live as long as it should have um, in the wild. And it's maybe not gonna be as as intelligent, as smart, as healthy, Just it's just not gonna be, they're gonna be good because you're two different species you're mixing things that shouldn't be mixed and this is where if you do take my marine biology class ever you know based on this lecture that mermaids can't exist I'm sucks I love mermaids but yeah they're totally not real if you can't even get two species to mate you certainly can't get two phylums well yeah <laughs> right not gonna happen and they're not two phylums but they are two um, classes basically uh, yeah you can't have Ossique bees and mammalian get together because you can't even have two species do it. You certainly can't have two classes do it. So no, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Yeah, yeah, sorry to mermaids. All right, so just to rehash real quick, right? Prezygotic barriers are all these right here, right? We have temporal isolation, don't mate at the same time. Same time of day, same time of year, doesn't matter. Just don't mate at the same time. Habitat isolation, you're not even in the same habitat. You're separated by a mountain range. How are you supposed to reproduce if there's a mountain in between you? Uh, behavioral isolation, you do this, but she likes this. So she's never going to choose you as a mate, and therefore the mating attempt is never even going to happen. Uh, if you do actually have a mating attempt, maybe your mechanics don't line up. Um, my girlfriend works on frogs, and there is definitely two species of frogs that live in the same area. The female will lay on a branch like this and the male will get on top of hers. It's called aplexy, uh, apoplexy, apoplexy, there it is. She'd kill me if I didn't get that right. So the male basically sits on top of her and then he vibrates his pelvis, right, to kind of trigger her to go, oh, I'm supposed to lay my eggs now. Then she lays the eggs and he fertilizes them. Well, there's a different species that will try to mate with that frog. It's way too small. So now the female sitting here, the male He's like really dinky and he sits way back here. So he vibrates his pelvis way over here. He's not even on her when he's vibrating his pelvis. So she doesn't even get that. Okay, so yeah, they mated, right? But they're not going to actually have success with that because they're two different species. 
Gametic isolation, finally, again, uh, and that would be, again, mechanical isolation. The genitalia did not line up. Uh, gametic isolation, the sperm and the egg just can't, they just can't get together to form that zygote. If you do have fertilization, right, the zygote forms, you're actually going to have now post-zygotic barriers. You're either going to have reduced hybrid viability, you're going to have reduced hybrid fertility, or you're just going to have hybrid breakdown. Right? They're not going to be able to survive, they're not going to be able to last as long, and they're not going to be able to reproduce on their own, they're not going to be, have their own offspring. If all of those things, if you were able to get over all of those barriers, you made it at the same time, and your, your genitalia lined up, and the sperm and the egg talked to each other, and your vi uh, offspring was viable, and had its own baby, then, boom, you would have no barriers, and you would be considered the same species. Okay, so you'd have to get through all of these zygotic barriers, pre and post, um, to be able to actually mate. If you were able to actually mate, then boom, yes, you are the same species. Okay, let's get into some of the mechanisms behind speciation. Remember that speciation just means the creation of a new species. So how does this actually occur? How, do, how did we know that those two birds are different species? Now, there's a couple different things that can actually separate or um, diverge two species out into their own. Um, one of them is called allopatric speciation. Essentially what is happening here is you have that geographic isolation. So imagine you had a founding population, right? But there was a big earthquake and now all of a sudden you have a barrier in between. You have a river that was no longer, but that wasn't there before. You have a gully or a valley or something that wasn't there before. Something that has separated your initial population. You had one population that was all interbreeding with each other. But now, due to some geographic factor, there's something stopping you. Um, could be as simple as a highway, right? Highways are actually terrible for um, geographic, uh, you know, mating and stuff like that because they separate, especially they separate these huge, huge stretches of land from each other. So now, all of a sudden, the organisms on this side of the freeway might eventually become so different that they're different than the organisms on this side of the freeway. And that's something we're going to talk about. But that is allopatric speciation. The other one is sympatric speciation, meaning they're in the same place, they're still in the same place, but for whatever reason, they develop small differences in that same place. So now this one initial population that you had is now two populations, even though they're living right next to each other, or even sometimes intermitted, for whatever reason, they're different now. So let's go into some of those examples here. So this is going to be allopatric speciation. We have our initial population of trees, now we have this big mountain range, right? So now our original population is slightly different than this new population. So we had all green trees, but now maybe the trees on this side of the mountain stay the same, but these, for whatever reason, became a little bit different. Now, if they were to come back together, say this mountain range disappeared, that's not how that works, but say this mountain range disappeared, now these two trees would not be able to reproduce with each other because they're so different. This is speciation. They were the same, and now they're different based on small, subtle differences. Maybe they started reproducing in two different times. Maybe this guy gets a lot of water in the spring, this guy gets a lot of water in the summer, so they only reproduce in the summer. Now they're reproducing in two different times, right? They were the same species of trees, but now those reproductive barriers come into play. Now you can't reproduce. Now you're a different species. This is sympatric or same place speciation, okay? So you still have those green trees, those dark green trees, but for whatever re um, reason, a smaller group, a smaller population of that original big population has now diverged and become slightly different so that they now cannot reproduce with the trees. Even if they're right next to each other, they still just can't for whatever reason. Again, it could be timing, it could be space, it could be hormones, it could be anything like that. Whatever, whatever means. It just means that you can't reproduce at the same time anymore or you can't reproduce with that species anymore. Okay, so here's a classic example of these little squirrels. These are little ground squirrels. And they lived in Arizona when the Colorado River was small. And it didn't cut out this gigantic Grand Canyon cavern. So now, little by little, you had erosion, right? You had erosion, 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 erosion. To the point where now you have this huge, deep valley in between these two lands. So what used to be one population of squirrels that was able to cross over that little river and go back and forth is now separated by a geographic barrier that's allopatric speciation okay now this squirrel is very different than this squirrel so notice that the genos um ge genuses are the same but the species are different and that's because something happened a long time ago like the grand canyon 
that actually created a physical barrier. And now if they were to come in contact with each other, they are different. They're too different now. This guy is a little bit darker than this guy. Maybe this guy is a slightly bigger tail than this guy. And again, a lot of these, especially these advanced animals, are going to have things like mate choice. So a female of this species over here would be like, dude, I don't, you're not even attracted to me because I like them dark with big, with little tails and you have a big tail and you're too light in color. Something like that. Something as simple as behavioral, um, behave like one of those behavioral isolations can cause speciation. Now they've been reproducing on this side for so long, reproducing on this side for so long, there's no flow back and forth that they have become different species. And again, remember all about gene flow and stuff from the evolution lecture. And if you don't, go back and rewatch that lecture. All right. So um, if they are allopatric speciation, that means they did speciate, right? They are different species. So we had a similar population. Now, because of our geographic barrier, boom, we come two populations. Now, if that geographic barrier were to disappear, we would still have two distinct populations. Now we would have reproductive isolation. They cannot reproduce with one another. Therefore, they're not, interbre they're not interbreeding. They're not the same species anymore. However, if you don't have allopatric, meaning, meaning if you don't have speciation, maybe you have allopatric, they're still, they're still distant from each other, but they're not different enough. So say maybe you have these geographic barrier that came in, but you know, the squirrels didn't change that much. They stayed the same color, their tails stayed the same length, they were feeding on the same stuff, they were feeding in the same time, exactly what they did before. Now, if you were to get rid of these two, of these two different populations, and they became sympatric again, meaning in the same place, right, the populations can still interbreed, they're not speciated. So not every kind of um, allopatric separation is going to cause speciation, only when they become so different that they're not able to reproduce anymore, then are they finally a separate species. If they can still reproduce with each other, even after, we're talking hundreds of thousands of years, even if they can come back and reproduce, they're still the same species. They're not a different enough species. They have not changed enough. And therefore, they're not a different species. They are the same. Sympatric speciation, again, happening in the same place. They are not geographically separated from each other. But something happened to make them different. Some either in their cell division or when the chromosomes are splitting or some kind of unique trait came on to a point where now they can't reproduce. And a lot of times this happens with um, uh, plants. Mostly it happens with plants because some kind of genetic little tiny mutation happened and now they just aren't quite able to reproduce like they were in the past. Now, sometimes these plants, because they're plants, they're not as more, they're not as complicated as we are. Sometimes they can still reproduce um, because of things like polyploidy. So polyploidy is essentially where you have multiple genes. So you have extra copies of your genes. Um, and this can happen through hybridization. Um, so what, basically what you're doing is you're taking two plant species that aren't exactly the same anymore and you're kind of trying to hybridize them you can actually get things with extra copies of chromosomes. So you actually have things with like more DNA. I can tell you right now, strawberries have, we have two sets of chromosomes, right? Cause we're diploid. Strawberries are polyploidy because they have nine. They have nine chromosomes, nine copies of each chromosome. Like that's so much DNA. Why do you have so much DNA? In fact, if you guys can actually do some, do this at home, if you'd like to, you take strawberries, and you can do this, it's called strawberry DNA extraction. You can actually extract the DNA from strawberry using household products. I think it's like laundry detergent. Oh my God, it's like laundry detergent and something else. It's really simple. You just basically mix them together. Like you crush up the strawberries, you mix them together. And then you can actually pull out. You can see DNA. You can see it just like floating there. And that's because strawberries have so much DNA. So again, this is something that happens with plants a lot. This polyploidy. Um, so these are some other organisms that are considered polyploidy, um, basically just because of that sympatric speciation. So they've, they've, well, not all, sorry. These are considered sympatric speciation. Not all of them are polyploidy. Um, I can tell you that the, um, wheat for sure is, but strawberries aren't on here. Um, so again, these are basically just kind of like diverging off, becoming slightly different, even though they're, they're in the same location. They're now slightly different species just because of, of probably errors in mitosis or maybe small genetic uh, mutations, something like that, that have created enough differences that they are now officially different and officially a different species, even though they're in the same place. 
Um, yep, so again, this would be... So there's differences between microevolution and macroevolution. Um, so something that's microevolution is going to be very on like a small scale. So that would be something like, you know, the two different species of squirrel, right? Nothing really happened. You just had a little bit of erosion and now you have the Grand Canyon and now you have two different, slightly different species of squirrels, right? That's microevolution. That's really small evolution. Um, the fact that we have gone from a single cell bacteria to us, that's macroevolution. Okay, so macroevolution is a little bit harder to see. It's usually happening on a larger scale. It's not impossible to see. But microevolution, meaning speciation, that's something that we can actually see in our daily lives. Um, so I forget what, there was like a new example of, ah, there was some island, I want to say, it, maybe it was one of the Galapagos Islands where um, they had basically introduced a, seri a species of iguana that lived on the mainland. And they were like, well, if it can survive on the mainland, maybe it can survive here. And they noticed that they were like eating things like leaves and stuff like that. But when they put them on the island, they didn't have a lot of leaves. So they actually started changing and they started evolving weird, um, to eat bugs. And because of that, their morphology changed. And it changed enough that they became a whole different species. That's, that's microevolution. That's just changing from one species of iguana to another. That's not big changes like, you know, us going from... Well, us going from, you know, the the ancestor of a chimpanzee to what we are now. That's a big change. So, again, the microevolutionary changes can happen on a very small scale, like the things with um, antibiotic-resistant bacteria and stuff like that. Those are microevolutions. Um, and then macroevolutions are leading to really, really big, dramatic changes. Like the fact that we are mammals and whales are mammals. We look totally different than whales. We live totally different than whales. That's macroevolution. That's way harder to see. Um, but not impossible. You just have to look at all the intermediates to get us from, you know, monkeys to whales. It's crazy. Um, here are some of the classic examples of geological time scales and things that have happened. Um, like the Precambrian period, this is basically when Earth was um, created. So we believe that that happened um, <laughs> about 4.6 billion years ago, some really crazy thing. And then you have the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, the Cenozoic or, um, era. All of these are major kind of like evolutionary time points in life um, that you can kind of see like, you know, where things were evolved. This is a scale over here. So you can see that the Precambrian time scale is huge, right? Precambrian was like the bulk of Earth forming Earth. And you can think of that, that kind of makes sense. Because, you know, there wasn't atmosphere back in the day. There wasn't nutrients in the soil back in the day. There wasn't any of these things back in the day. I mean, we were like essentially a floating ball of gases that condensed and heated and cooled and heated and cooled and then actually formed our planet. Um, so that's the bulk of, of Earth's time period is nothing was really here. Then you're going to get the Cambrian time, mostly the Precambrian, um, sorry, the Precambrian and Cambrian explosion. This is where, like, the bulk of life, like, the bulk of the diversity of life actually came from. So this really, like, tiny, tiny little thing right here, the sliver of life, which happened about 400 and about 500 million years ago, that's where the bulk of the diversity in life came from. And then slowly we've just kind of been diverging off from them um, and becoming the things that we are today. Now, so not everyone made it, like the dinosaurs, but we got birds from it. It's a relative. Um, you know, trilobites aren't around anymore, but, you know, ancient arthropods like, well, like crabs and stuff still are. Sharks are still around. Sharks really haven't evolved much since they kind of came into evolutionary prime. In fact, fun fact, uh, modern day sharks are older as a group than trees. Think about that. There were sharks on this planet before there were actual trees. Now there were like shrubs and bushes and grasses, but there were no trees. How crazy is that? I know. I'm sorry. I love sharks. You should know that. Okay, and now we're going to watch this little video right here, um, and then you guys will have an assignment on it, so make sure that you guys do watch the video. The diversity of animals on our planet is breathtaking. Millions of species adapted to all kinds of habitats. Ever since Darwin, understanding how so many species evolved has been a major quest of biology. And biologists like Jonathan Lossus. In the Caribbean, he's studying a remarkable group of lizards. 
quarterback. He's finding clues to their origins in their bodies, their lifestyles, and in their DNA. Well, there's one out there. These lizards are providing fresh insight into both how new species form and why our world is filled with so many creatures. I don't see you, lizard. Here in Puerto Rico, Jonathan is stalking lizards called anoles. Okay, here we go. With almost 30 years of practice, he's a pro at catching them. There we go. He's okay. They've got very strong necks. This actually doesn't hurt them at all. He's a healthy, fine-looking specimen. Puerto Rico's anoles all feed on similar food, mostly small prey like spiders and crickets. But they divide up their habitats in a clever way. The long-tailed slender species Jonathan caught lives in grasses and bushes and is called a grass bush anole. On the low parts of tree trunks and on the ground, a longer-legged, stockier species forages, called a trunk ground anole. And higher up the tree lives another anole species. On twigs and small branches like these, we find very small anoles with really short legs. This slender lizard is called a twig anole. Further up the tree is yet another species. High up in the canopy, there's a large green lizard with big toe pads. He lives high off the ground. There's one right there. Like apartment dwellers, each species lives in a different vertical space. But here, each floor offers unique evolutionary opportunities to its inhabitants. The fact that lizards differ in leg length and toe pad size, depending on where they live, suggests that these differences in traits are adaptations to the lizard's habitats. Here's a good tree over here. To test whether that is in fact the case, I came here to help Jonathan conduct some experiments. Yeah, these lizards are very cooperative. We begin by comparing the running ability of two lizards. Short legs, yeah. One with long legs, the other with short ones. Let's do some tests. Let's start with this little lizard here and see how fast it can run up this broad surface. All right, I'll catch him if he makes it to the end. All right, here we go. There he comes. Wow. She's a sprinter. Exactly. She lives at the bottom of trees, right in the open. She catches prey on the ground, so she has to run down quickly to get them. The shorter-legged twig lizard is not nearly as fast. It seems like a disadvantage. Why aren't their legs longer? Jonathan puts a twig lizard on a thin branch to demonstrate. All right, let's see how he does. There we go. Looks pretty comfortable there. Yeah. Just sort of scurrying along like a balance beam. This is what they love. Instead of speed, the twig lizard's legs provide a firm grasp. All right, now let's try the other one. So this is the sprinter. This is the sprinter. Let's see how she fares on this little stick. Look how ungainly she is. Her legs are too long for this. So you can see on these narrow surfaces, long legs are a disadvantage. On twigs, long legs only increase the chance of falling. So ground lizards have evolved long legs and twig lizards short ones that enabled their lifestyles. Next, we compare how well two species can climb the slick surfaces of leaves. Anoles have different sized toe pads on their feet, 
we'll see if these help them navigate different environments. So it's time for Lizard Olympics part two. All right, I'm game for that. Here's the ground lizard. Let's see if you can hang on and move up it. Oh, oh no. Couldn't even hang on. Cannot hang on. Let's try it again. Here he goes. He's, he's getting up there. He's able to move up, but not very easily. All right, let's do another species. All right. Take a oh look my at goodness. this guy. That's an anole. This is the big canopy lizard. Let's see how he does. Well, it's not a fair contest. He's so huge. There's no way for him to hold up his weight. What do you think now, smart guy? <laughs> okay, he proved me wrong. Pretty impressive. He's using the, the little microscopic hairs on his toe pads to bond with the surface, and that's what holds him up. And his toe pads are bigger than other lizards? Yes, they are. Even He's a bigger lizard, but even for his size, he has particularly large toe pads. So this is an adaptation. This is an adaptation because he cannot afford to fall out of the canopy. But how do these adaptations arise? Jonathan and his colleagues wanted to see if they could observe the lizard's traits evolve by conducting another kind of experiment. Their inspiration was the rapidly changing environment of some of the smallest Caribbean islands. Hurricanes occasionally swamp these tiny islands, scrubbing them free of lizards. The team realized they could use the depleted islands as laboratories. They began their experiment by capturing tree-dwelling anoles on a larger island. Oh, there's one out there. Yeah. Good. Then they visited seven islands that a hurricane had cleared of lizards. On each, they placed a female and male anole. These islands have no trees, only small bushes. How would the long-legged lizards fare on thin branches? The next year, the scientists returned. She will be back. They found that the mating pairs they had introduced not only survived, but reproduced. population had grown and taken to living on thin branches. And now she's in my nose. The scientists collected the lizards. So the height off, every time we found a lizard, we measured how high it was off the ground, 40 centimeters, the diameter of the surface, okay. and whether it was perched head up, head down, or horizontal. They brought them back to their field lab, took x-rays to precisely measure the length of their legs, scan their toe pads. Then they returned each lizard to the exact spot where they had found it. Okay, all right. Well. Now they had baseline data on the new populations. A year later, they came back. All right, I think he gave us a slip. Okay. Uh, Excellent. and discovered that the average lizard leg had shortened in just two generations. Well, we thought maybe this is just a fluke, a statistical accident. In fact, over four years, the populations all got shorter and shorter and shorter legs. Evolution can occur very rapidly when natural selection is strong. Adaptations like these explain how different body types evolve but they do not explain how new and old species arise. It's changes in other traits that play a key role in speciation. Two groups of animals are defined as different species when individuals from one group don't mate and reproduce with those from the other. So for a population to become a new species, something has to prevent its members from breeding with members of closely related populations. This is called reproductive isolation. 
One way a species can split into two is for populations to separate geographically. Over many generations, they can undergo enough changes in their respective habitats that if and when they come back together again, they don't mate. So what kind of changes keep the knolls from mating? Anoles have a flap of skin under their throats called a dewlap, which males display to attract females. And remarkably, every species in the same area has a different dewlap. So a change in a dewlap is a critical step in the formation of new anole species. John, why would these dewlap colors change? Consider this grass lizard that lives here in the forest where it's relatively dark. And if we look at its dewlap, you can see it's pretty light colored. Now suppose that a population of these lizards ended up in an area that was much more open and sunnier. In that case, a light colored dewlap isn't very effective. So over time, the population would evolve by natural selection to have darker dewlaps. And we might end up with this one. And he's got a much darker dewlap much more visible in a light open habitat. If for some reason these two populations come together, the females would no longer recognize the males as members of the same species. They wouldn't mate. They would be reproductively isolated. There's a simple connection between changes within populations, or microevolution, and the formation of new species, or macroevolution. When changes within populations include traits involved in mating, like dewlap color, then the stage is set for the formation of new species. Once new species have formed, competition drives the evolution of different body types. Species living in the same area compete for resources. But if members of one species move into another habitat, they can use resources not available to the other species. Over many generations, natural selection favors traits that enable species to occupy different habitats. This process has led to the body types we see in Puerto Rico. And not just there. On each of the Caribbean's four largest islands, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, Cuba, and Hispaniola, we find the same distribution of similar looking lizards. Now you think that all the lizards on the different islands would look different, but they don't. Each island has the same basic body types. Each island has slender grass bush anoles with long tails, long legged trunk ground anoles, short-legged twig anoles, and canopy anoles with large toe pads. How did each island end up with the same body types? Did each body type evolve once and then spread to the other islands? Or did each type evolve independently on each island? So I'm going to be sequencing some additional markers for this. To find out, Jonathan and his colleagues sequenced the DNA of the knolls from each island. They examined the same stretch of DNA from many species to uncover their evolutionary relationships. Species that are more closely related, we wouldn't expect to have many differences in their DNA. For example, these two species here, if you go across here, there's only one base pair where they're different. That's because they're very closely related. On the other hand, this species here has many differences. Here, 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 and here. That's because this species diverged from the other ones a long time ago. After determining which two species were most closely related, they joined them together with a node representing a common ancestor. Then they joined these to the next most closely related until all the lizards were united in a phylogenetic tree. The DNA revealed a pattern consistent with this. 
the lizards on each island tend to be more closely related to each other than to similar looking lizards on different islands. That means that generally the same types of lizards evolved independently on each island. On all of the large Caribbean islands, the same traits have evolved again and again. Body color, limb length, toe pad size. Moreover, this repeated filling of habitats on each island by anoles illustrates why our planet has so many species. The simple reason why there are so many species in the world is that there are so many habitats. And each habitat provides numerous ways to survive. In the Serengeti, zebras eat the tallest, coarsest grass. Wildebeest, the medium height grass and Thompson's gazelles, the shortest. In the Galapagos, some finches primarily eat seeds on the ground, and others, insects in the trees. Look around you, in your backyard or around the world. There are so many different environments, each full of creatures making a living in a different way. that video was super helpful this is the link if it doesn't work um, sometimes it doesn't work so you can just google the origin of species of lizards in the evolutionary tree really really super helpful it totally corresponds to last week's lecture um, the evolution lecture and this one as well hopefully it kind of like helps you answer some of those questions because you can actually see with those cute little animations and stuff so really really helpful um, you will have an assignment on this so make sure to always check the canvas site for due dates quiz quizzes all that homework stuff um, as usual, like you guys know, but you'll have a quick little something or other on this little guy. Um, by the way, when it was talking, when he was talking about using different resources in different ways, like feeding on the bottom of the tree, feeding in the middle of the tree, feeding on the top of the tree, that's called resource partitioning. So you partition out or you separate out the resources. When there's nobody in direct competition with each other, then everybody wins. Right? We're still eating bugs, but you're eating them down here and I'm eating them up here, so we're not actually going to have to fight over these resources. So this is really, really important and again, allows for many, many different species to live in a single area, um, perhaps using a single resource because they do it in different ways. Sometimes one organism feeds in the nighttime, the other one feeds in the daytime. So nobody's actually competing with each other because, you know, they're feeding at different times. This allows for really, really high um, population densities and species diversity. So you get more species and you get more different species because they can all use the resource without actually having to compete with each other. So that's what we saw on those islands. Um, and that's why we saw individual evolution on each one of those islands um, leading to the same result. You had the same result. And so that's what we were talking about also in our evolution lecture when it talks to geographic proximity. Every organism on that, every, well, every anole on those islands are going to be closely related to each other versus the anoles on different islands. Because however they got there, it must have been a long, much more, much more in the past um, than, than just those uh, lizards getting slight differences while living on the island together. So again, they got on that island together, so they're all closely related, but you know, lizards who floated to a different island, even if it's close by, they're still gonna be more differently related than all the lizards on this island and all the lizards on this island together. They're gonna be differently related. Um, and especially if you're not even on the, not even in the region, if you're across the world, and you're way gonna be way different from each other, even though you might look the same. We just learned that there's evolutionary similarities that come up because of these environments, because of these ecosystems that they're in. So important to keep that in mind. So resource partitioning, organisms using the same resource in slightly different ways, so there's no competition with each other. So allows for greater species diversity. And with that, um, that's all I got for you guys for this lecture. So I will see you next time and make sure to check the Canvas site for any upcoming test assignments, etc. And um, have a wonderful day.